Hello everybody, thank you for being here. Um, as he was saying, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about compressed sensing, which is like a new paradigm in the acquisition of signals. And I'm going to talk to you about the application of compressed sensing in indoor radio localization. Uh, first of all, I want to, to tell you something about me. I'm, my name is Cristina Gomez. I come from Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana. I work in there as a professor and researcher in the telecommunications area. However, recently I've been changing a little bit my area to all the machine learning world and deep learning world, but still related with some telecommunication applications. Also, we have now with some colleagues, we have founded a startup which is called Maya Technologies, and we are working in all these topics, natural language processing, and anti-fraud or fraud detection in real time, and all these kind of applications um, currently. <laughs> So first of all, I want to talk to you a little bit about, about compressed sensing. I don't know how many of you have listened about this topic or, or have heard about compressed sensing. Some of you, okay. So uh, for those that have no clue about this topic, this is like a new paradigm in acquisition of signals that uh, is expected to change um, most of the electronics that we have today. The reason is um, we have, for instance, these two images that you see in here. These two images are like flower images, flower pictures, as you can see. The, this one is a raw image, like in the natural format of the image, and this one is the format of the image in a compressed um, presentation, like with a, a JPEG format for compression or something like that. This is the classical point of view of, of compression in images that we are currently using in most of the, of the technologies that we have uh, today. And basically, the way this works, this is the classical approach, the way this works is that you have your sensor, in this case the sensor is a camera, with this sensor you acquire the image, right? Then when you acquire the image, you are doing a discretization of the image, this is what we call the sampling of the image, and after sampling the image, you do the compression, okay? So this is the classical point of view of compression that we have been using all these years. And this is the way formats like uh, JPEG, MP, MP3 and other formats actually work today. Uh, after you compress the image, then you transmit or store the image, and then you receive, of course, decompress, and then you get the same image you, have, you had at the transmitter side. So that's the classical approach, okay? Um, in these um, two images, we can have, for instance, an original image and a transformed image, but in this transformed image, the key aspect is that all the the um, smallest coefficients of this image are rounded to zero. As you can see, our eyes cannot uh, sense the dis a distinction between bo both images. It's almost the same. And this is because of the way our eyes work, okay? So that's like the, the um, let's say, the way classical compression formats actually work in order to reduce the amount of data you need to process, store, and transmit through a channel that will, um, that will not be helpful with you when you want to transmit a signal. All the channels um, produce mistakes, produce uh, noise, produce uh, things that doesn't help you to transmit the signal. However, Recently, like recently, it's like 2006 or something like that. Not so recently, but it's almost recently. <laughs> um, there have been there have been new discoveries related to the way you can acquire the signal, because if you have a signal that is considered sparse, sparse means that you have a lot of the components of the signal close to zero or very small. This, this case is, close, uh, is uh, exactly zero, and in this other case you have small components. 
in both cases, from the pra practical point of view, you are talking about a sparse signal. When you are talking about a sparse signal, some researchers in 2006 from Stanford University discovered a way to recover this signal um, not following the Nyquist sampling theorem. The thing is, in the classical approach, which is this one, when you do this step, the sampling of the signal, when you do the acquisition of the signal, you have to do it at a very specific rate. If you don't do it at that specific rate, you will not be able to recover the original signal. And this is the classical perspective or the classical signal theory that we have been using all these years. However, with this new paradigm of compressed sensing, the key is that you can do the acquisition of the signal at a sample rate that is not following the Nyquist rate that we have been following all these years. Only if your signal is sparse. It, it, your signal uh, has this behavior or this behavior. You, will, you can do the sampling in another way and you will have the opportunity, you, you will be able to recover the original signal almost with the same quality of the original signal. This change, changes everything. It changes everything because this means that, for instance, before you had a song and the song uh, had a 15 kilohertz of bandwidth, then you had to do the sampling at 30 kilohertz because this is the Nyquist theorem, this is the sampling rate that classical signal processing theory uh, imposes when you do the signal acquisition. But now you don't have to do it at that rate. You can actually do it at a lower rate. So this changes everything because this changes the way you make the sampling of the signal. This changes the amount of samples of the signal that you have to store the amount of samples of the signal that you have to process and the amount of samples of the signal that you have to transmit. So it changes everything. Um, everything has a price, so the thing with compressed sensing, uh, I will explain it a little bit deeply later, but the price that you're paying is that you are kind of simplifying the sampling, but you make a little bit, complex, uh, a little bit more complex the receiver, yeah, in, in a certain way. So w w is there is like a, um, you always have to do like a compromiso. How do you say compromiso? I don't know. Trade-off, thank you. Trade-off. <laughs> so you always have to do a trade-off between different um, uh, design criteria in your systems. So in the classical point of view, when you were doing the acquisition of the signal, the discretization of the signal and, and the compression of the signal, you had to measure everything, all the pixels and all the coefficients of the signals. You had to, de to keep the, the largest coefficients, trying to keep the distortion as low as possible. That was the classical point of view. With the compressed sensing point of view, what we do is that we can take M random measurements where this number M is much lower than this number D. And you can do it in a random way. We don't have to follow the periodicity imposed by the Nyquist theorem in the classical approach, but we can do it in a random way. Like I can take just, just an example, I can take only this sample, this other sample, and this other sample, something like that. You just have to do it in, in a smart way. But you can take only those samples randomly, and you will be able to recover the original signal. Okay? That's the, the change. And when you do the reconstruction of, this, of the original signal, you can do it through linear programming. This means you can do it minimizing the L1 norm of the signal. Before, or with other techniques, usually what you do was to work with the L2 norm, and the L2 norm has some advantages and disadvantages. So in this case, using the L1 norm gives you actually uh, many advantages in the reconstruction step of, of the signal, I'm sorry. So I'm going to do a classical explanation of the reconstruction process. This is like um, only to, to start with the subject. You can find this information, some of this information in this, in this blog. It's really good. I recommend it if you want to read a little bit more about this. So I'm going to use these libraries in the entire Jupyter Notebook. This will be able in GitHub. I don't have it in there yet, but I will put it in there so anybody can look for it and study it. 
Um, we're using the classical NumPy Matplotlib. We're using the SciPy Optimize, the FFT Pack, the SciPy and the Image, and the Convex um, Optimization Library, and that's mainly it. So first, we start creating like a, a line. Yes, we are going to create a line in here, and we are going to do a fitting of the line to a, um, with through the L1 norm. Okay. So the fitting of, of the um, line through the L1 norm is done through this uh, function uh, from the optimization library. And these are the results that we obtain. These are actually the parameters of the line that best fits the points that we generated through this equation. Okay? As you can see, this equation is the equation of, the, of um, uh, a line, a yeah, straight line. But we have some random noise in here, yeah, inserted in the line, just to change a little bit the signal and to see how the fit works. So when you use the L1 norm, um, this is the result of the parameters of the line that best fits the points that we generated. And when you, we use the L2 fit norm, these are the parameters. As you can see, this is almost the same, fo the same um, code lines. All I'm changing is uh, this part in here. This one is the L2 norm, and this one is the L1 norm, right? That's the main difference. Uh, and then these are the coefficients of the line that best fits the points generated before through the L2 norm, through the minimization of the L2 norm. If we plot the results of the optimization process, we, we get this. The blue points are the points generated with a, a little bit of you know, random noise to change a little bit the behavior of them. And as you can see, the reconstruction or the fitting through the L1 norm and the L2 norm are very similar. Both of them work actually very good. If we start inserting a little bit of outliers to those points, then what we will, we will have is Again, if we do the fitting of, the, of those points through a line uh, minimizing the L2 norm and the L1 norm, what we get is a behavior like this. If we compare, these are the two outliers that we manually generated. Yeah, manually generated, I mean in here, right? Manually generated, like something more extreme, a change more extreme in, in those dots that we have in there. And what we can observe in this case is that the L1 norm fits better the behavior of all these points and actually looks more robust to the change to, to the um, outliers. Okay. However, the L2 norm is much more sensitive to it. So this is why this is one of the main advantages of using the L1 norm through the compressed sensing. I mean, it's the other way around. It, Compressed sensing, uh, since gives you the opportunity to do the reconstruction through L1 norm, gives you the opportunity to the opportunity to have a reconstruction like more robust to some points, really like uh, behaving like outliers. Okay. So, another example, another example using sound waves. These are like sound waves synthetically created. We have three tones. These are three pure tones at these frequencies. Uh, these are the three tones in the time domain, as you can see in here. This is like a little zoom of the first part of the signals. And if we get the discrete cosine transform of these signals, then we obtain the three tones. And this is a zoom of the three tones. The three tones pure as, as they are, right? Um, I don't know if everybody knows, but the discrete, um, uh, discrete cosine transform is one of the main transforms that, that we use in images in order to do the compression of the image in classical approaches. The reason why we use it is because it has a behavior like this. It, can, it allows you to express a signal that looks in the time domain like very confusing with a lot of different amplitudes and different components. If you see the same signal from another perspective that is not time but frequency, what you see is almost three components three significant, significant components. The rest of, of the signal that you can see are almost uh, like zeros or almost zeros components. So this gives you a, a, a huge um, opportunity or advantage because if you process the signal in this, from this perspective, then it's kind of like having less, less data to be processed or having to, to reduce the amount of data that you require. So trying to, um, um, 
trying to reproduce what uh, compressed sensing does, what we are doing is selecting only the 10% of the original signal. The original signal was created in here uh, in the code, as you can see. This is the original signal, the sum of the three uh, pure tones. And if I only take 10% of that signal, this will be the second signal created in here, right? This signal. I only take 10% of the samples, and actually, I take them randomly, not in a periodic basis, just randomly. I just take them randomly. Then if I plot those samples that, uh, that I read from the original signal, what we can see is something like this. This was the original signal in the time domain. The red dots are like the samples that you are randomly chosen. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, which are only the 10% of the original samples that you had. If you um, plot a continuous line between those uh, randomly selected samples, what you will get is something like this. This signal doesn't look at all like the original signal, right? In the time domain, it doesn't look at all like that. And as you can see, these are not, are not periodic. They have like a random basis. So the question is, from these random uh, signals that we, random samples that we read from the original signal, is it possible to recover the original signal? And the answer from the compressed sensing point of view is yes, you can do it. And you can do it through uh, linear programming, only if the signal is sparse. As you can see, when we used the discrete cosine transform in order to see the same signal, not in time, but in frequency, what we demonstrated in here is that that signal was sparse in the frequency domain. Because remember that the sparsity was trying to identify a behavior of the signal in such a way that you have just a few components, just a few significant components, and a lot of components really close to zero. So the conclusion is that this signal is actually a sparse signal. And if this signal is sparse, then you can do a, a, a reconstruction through linear programming. So in this case, the goal is, the, the objective is to find a signal that matches the best possible way the sample, sample data, the ram, randomly sampled data. And second of all, we need to minimize the L1 norm of the frequencies of the, of the fre frequencies of the signal. So through the convex, op convex optimization library in Python, we can solve this through this uh, generation of this matrix. I will talk to you about this matrix uh, just in a few seconds. This is a matrix that corresponds to the inverse discrete cosine transform of the signal that we had before. And I, I'm sorry, this is for of, the ide of an identity matrix. And through the, the use of this matrix, we will use, uh, we will define the convex optimization problem through this way. We will define the objective or the cost function of the optimization problem as the minimization of the L1 norm of our variables. This is restricted to having the, um, the target variables multiplied by this matrix I, I will talk to you about equal to the original signal. So wh what we are saying, what we are um, writing here in these equations is actually what we were saying in these sentences. Okay, we are defining the mathematical problem that do these things. Okay, and then we solve it. The solution is in here. It doesn't take too too long. It is actually very fast, and I will come here la a little bit later. But what I wanted to show you was that actually. From those random samples, what we finally do is reconstruct the signal. In this side, in the left side of the plot, what you can see is the original signal and the frequency behavior of that signal. And in the right side of the plot, what we have is the reconstructed signal and the frequency be, uh, version of the reconstructed signal. What you can see is that both of them are very similar. And it's kind of magic because you only read 10% of the samples that you had up, uh, from the original signal. This means that you are doing a compression, a very high compression, and you are doing it through a random basis. So this is kind of like the key of compressed sensing, okay? 
What I was going to, talk, to tell you about that famous matrix A, that matrix A is the key of everything in compressed sensing. You, if you start reading about compressed sensing, you will always, everywhere, find this explanation and you will always find this set of equations. And what they are trying to express is that you have a linear problem when you, where you have um, an, uh, a signal that you want to reconstruct some measurements of the signal, these are the measurements that you take in a random way, and you have a matrix or a transformation that takes you from the original signal to the randomly chosen samples of, of the signal. So this matrix actually um, performs two tasks. The first of the tasks that this matrix performs is undersampling. This means taking less, sample, less samples than, than that what you would require following the Nyquist theorem or the classical si uh, processing signal theory. And the second task is that they will transform the domains. In this very specific example, it will transform the domain between frequency and time, okay? Because that was what we found before when, when we saw how the behavior of the signal was in time and how it was in frequency. So the two domains that are related in this very specific example are frequency and time. It doesn't have to be the same way for all the examples. Sometimes it could be frequency and space, time and space, or even other dim dimensions, okay? So the basic idea is that um, this matrix A is the key of everything. It, ha it performs two tasks, undersampling and transforming between different domains. This transforming between different domains means that you can apply compressed sensing to a signal that original, originally is not sparse. But when you transform the point of view, uh, or the perspective from where you are studying the signal, and in that world the signal is sparse, you can apply compressed sensing, okay? And the transformation is what takes you from one world to the other and allows you to apply the compressed sensing paradigm. Uh, finally, what we have is that this matrix A, which was the key of everything, can be decomposed in two linear operations, or I mean in two other matrices, Usually uh, they are called this way, C and phi, and what these matrices perform are those two tasks that are explained in here. One of them reads randomly the, the samples of the signal, and the other one transforms your original signal to a world where you can understand that signal as a sparse signal, okay? That's the basic idea. Um, so, as you can see, we can reconstruct like in a, with a very good quality the signal and you only have 10% of the information that you had before. So th this is like a huge uh, gain, a huge opportunity that you can start having. Uh, we have many applications of this, for instance, in images. I don't know if you know the famous one pixel MIT uh, camera. The people is working really hard in transforming the cameras that we are, uh, the, the cameras, you know, regular cameras, using filters in different ways, designed in different ways in order to be able to capture the signal from the source in a compressed sensing way. If you use a camera today, that camera is following the Nyquist theorem. It, this means it, it is reading the, the picture that is trying to, to photograph. It is reading it with a Nyquist uh, rate, okay? But if you start putting these kind of filters in the camera, then you can do it in from the compressed sensing point of view, okay? So a lot of people is working uh, right now in this. These are some examples in medicine. These are um, imagenología. I don't know how to say that in English. In my, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, these are different pictures. Uh, this is the fully sampled picture. This is the, the signal compressed six times uh, under the classical perspective. And this one is with compressed sensing. And what you can see is that the compressed sensing version is much better than the other one, okay? But carefully, because this is no, I mean, you have to be careful how to do it because it, it, it doesn't work all the time and you have to be careful how to do it. So an example with images will be something like this. I'm reading an image in this part, and you can see this is, a, again, the discrete um, cosine transform of an entire image. These are the credits of the image. Uh, uh -huh. These are the credits of the image. 
This is another point of view of the same discrete cosine transform. And we have, uh, if, we re if we read only 50% of the samples, we can apply the exact same process that we did before with the sound waves and still be able to recover the signal. Problem is, you can get a memory error really fast because the original image was extremely heavy. So, uh, fortunately, there have been a lot of studies and a, a lot of um, a lot of research in finding algorithms that solve in a very efficient way the linear programming, uh, the minimization of the L1 norm of the signal that I showed you before. And there are a lot of reconstruction algorithms that you can use actually to, do, to, to make this problem uh, solvable in a, in a um, fast way, okay? In the blog I mentioned before, you can find one of those algorithms implemented and in, in it actually works very good. Now, the radio localization application at the university, we have been working in a research project for several years right now. Uh, the radio localization is not completely solved. Uh, there are many problems in radio localization. For instance, when you um, don't have a line of sight with satellites, then you cannot um, receive the, the positioning of the GPS system in, a, in an accurate way. Or if you don't have the coverage of satellites, you can, cannot do it either. But especially in indoor radio localization, we, ha we have many problems. The problems with indoor radio localization is, is very clearly a, a, an open problem, and you can see it because the GPS can follow you until Universidad Javeriana, but there's no way that your cell phone can tell you you are in auditorio. Uh, I don't remember the name of this auditorium, but you are in this auditorium, in this uh, room exactly, in that chair. It cannot tell you that. So there has been a lot of research, a lot of competences worldwide recently um, in this topic. The, the main problem is that the dynamic of an indoor environment is really high. So, for instance, it's very different, the wireless channel behavior in this room, if you are all in here, is very different uh, if you go. Actually, if just one person starts walking, the behavior of the wireless channel changes like crazy. So this is an open problem and there have been some solutions, but what we tried to do with this research uh, project was try to find a perspective, like something that could be helpful using the compressed sensing paradigm. However, in the project we did it in an outdoor environment and after that we keep um, researching in the topic and we uh, today I am just showing you a proposal in the indoor radio localization problem specifically. You can find some, there are some references in here if you want to read a little bit about this, but this is an example of implementation of a radio localization, indoor radio localization. What we are assuming is that we have these cells. First of all, I want to tell you that the key when you, we have found so far that the key when you are analyzing radio localization, for instance, is that you have different transmitters or target nodes that you want to locate, and they are um, spatially distributed. If they are spatially distributed by nature, they are sparse. Okay, so in, uh, from the spatial domain, that signal, the signal that you are receiving from those transmitters is a sparse, is a sparse signal. So in the radio localization problem, problem, usually what you have are different target nodes. These are the nodes that you want to locate and different sensor nodes. And you can have different sensor nodes. Th those sensor nodes could be other cell phones, could be access points, Wi-Fi access points, for instance, or you can have different technology to do this. In this specific approach, they are considered a, a as Wi-Fi access points, okay? Distributed in an indoor room, like in this room or this floor, the floor of this building. Uh, they are communicating to a central unit that will have the, the, the processing capacity, or the, the capacity of processing all the signals received by these sensor nodes. And the, mm, the main structure is that we will define a grid in this space. So the size of this grid, as you can see, we have many cells in this plot. The size of this grid is going to be D. We will have K target nodes. We will have J access points, N time, time snapshots. This means a different instance of time where we are receiving and studying the signal. And we will do a compression in time. This means the compression, is the compressed sensing paradigm will be applied in a way that we, we will have to read less 
time snapshots of the signal. So the implementation goes like this. In here, we are defining the grid, all the structure and the architecture of what we want actually to implement. Um, let me, yeah. So the algorithm works like this. The entire radio localization solution goes like this. First, you do a training phase. And in the training phase, what you do is that all the access points start receiving the signal from the, from the transmitters, assuming that the transmitters are in this cell or this cell, this cell, this cell, in each one of the cells of the grid that you have in space. So this access point, in, this in blue are the access points. You start training. When you start training, what you are doing is building a dictionary, OK? So you're trying to, to assume, if I have a transmitter in here, what what will I see? What will I see? What, what will I see? Okay. After that, with that, we, be, we built the dictionary that I was mentioning through this process. As you can see, the dictionary has this size. This size corresponds to the number of access points you have, the size of the grid, and the number of time snapshots that you are reading. That's the complete dictionary of the radio localization um, algorithm. After that, this is, for instance, um, yeah, this is, for instance, for, for the first access point, and this is for the 10th access point, OK? So they have different dictionaries because each access point is uh, receiving a different perspective from the transmitters because they are uh, spatially distributed. So after that, uh, we have the runtime phase. So the first one was the training phase. Once you have built your dictionary, you go to the runtime phase. And in the runtime phase, you actually do the, tr the, the localization of your target node. So in this case, you have, again, your 10 access points, one target node, that is this one, the red one in here. And what, what we do is that we um, build an algorithm. Uh, I'm short of time, so uh, uh, you build the algorithm. This is based in the, I will go straight ahead the reconstruction algorithm called distributed SOMP. This is an algorithm uh, that was created and designed by the Candes and Donohoe, which are like the, the ones that found the compressed sensing theory and everything. And this algorithm is based in the, the reconstruction of the signal, just zooming up the perspective of each one of the uh, access points in this case. So all you have to do is to combine. This is the problem that is um, uh, that defines the, the algorithm. So all you have to do is to understand what is each one of the access points. Uh, as you can see, this is the perspective of each one of the access points. The first access point, what do you say, first access point? Where is the target node? And he says, the target node is in the third cell of the grid. And uh, no, second access point, where is the target node? And he says, it is in the fifth cell of the grid. And the next one is like a voting system. And who wins? The, the one that gets most votes. That's the algorithm. That's all it does. So in this case, for instance, it actually worked very good. Okay? Of course, I'm showing the best case. I'm not showing the cases where it doesn't work. Sometimes it doesn't work. It depends on many things. For instance, the topology and the number of access points you have, where they are located, how many target nodes do you have, how is the wireless channel that you are considering, for instance. There are many things that you need to understand. However, we were able to do the radio localization of that target node through compressed sensing. And I didn't mention that very explicitly, but do you remember I had an M up there? Uh, there was an M, and I told you that, that was the rate com it was related to the rate compression in time. So that M, oh, this is like blocking. That M is only 10%. Like this means I'm taking only 10, this N. The compression rate is M divided N. N was the total time snapshots that we had, and M is only the number of sna snapshots that I am randomly reading, okay? And that was, again, 10% of the samples in time of the signal. So this is the way we found, uh, we, we were able to apply the compressed sensing paradigm to indoor radio localization. Uh, uh, questions? <laughs> I'm out of time. Questions? Yes? Signal strength, yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so my question is, GPS works with time and then you measure the time difference for tri trilateration. Yes. Are you doing this with signal strength instead? Yeah, because the, the, as we were assuming the Wi-Fi access points and they use with RSSI. However, when we did the project um, in outdoor radio localization, we used hybrid algorithms, TDOA plus DOA. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Ot other. <laughs> Um, what, what changes do you see, uh, like let's say you have a conference and you put Bluetooth beacons all over the conference. And you put? And uh, Bluetooth beacons, uh -huh. um, like on the underside of every single booth. If you make the range of those very, very low, then it seems you can tri trilaterate without worrying about bouncing and other stuff like that. What changes have you seen or what struggles have you had when you increase the number of transmitters to a very high number um, but decrease the range so that it gets more accurate and more localized? Does that help? Does it hurt? Does it make it harder? Um, yeah, it depends. It's always a trade-off. I mean, there, there is a point where you can increase the number of, of access points and it actually works better or just change the topology and it actually works better. Um, but sometimes if you have, I mean, there is a rule in, in classical, like TDOA, the way per perspectives, like the number, like the classical theory says like three or two sensors with compressed sensing, one of the ways to apply it is trying to reduce the number of sensors that you require. That's one of the, the, the um, approaches people is following. In this case, for instance, it wasn't, that wasn't the approach. It was in the time snapshots. Uh, but there is not like an absolute uh, answer to that. It depends on many factors. So sometimes it works, sometimes it collapses, of course. If you start increasing the number of target nodes, even though you decrease the range, it collapses. It depends on many things. Um, have you thought about uh, ways to improve the, the process, maybe um, trying another algorithm? Or yes. yes, 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 of course, definitely. Actually, in this other, we are trying right now to extend some of the proposals that we did in, this, in these papers. Uh, well, two of the papers that, that I mentioned in there, uh, these ones, these were for the outdoor environment, but we are trying to do like an extension of this even in indoor environment. And the idea is to, to generate like a general framework, like a bigger framework, where you can incorporate TDOA, DOA, RSSI, and any other kind of information into your processing unit. And we are building like a reconstruction algorithm that, that uses OMP, but like in a um, different way, mixing it with smoothing functions in order to, we don't want to make the decisions of zero or one, like uh, access point is taking one decision. He can take like a probability of decisions or something smoother and trying to combine that and then have maybe a better behavior. So far we have reached a better behavior that way. We're still researching in that. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, to what degree does the system, once it is trained, uh, do, can, can it determine somehow um, how accurate it is? So, you uh -huh. mean, um, so if, it, if it gets like, it does a location, can it tell from itself without an external reference this is an accurate measurement or this is, you know, we're not sure? Um, I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure if I understand right, uh, correctly the, the question. There is a way to, to know, uh, to calibrate the system, something like that? Yeah, so you, you mentioned the, you, you calibrate the, the system once and then afterwards uh, you still have problems sometimes because of the, the interaction of the signals. Mm -hmm. um, once you do get a measurement, mm -hmm. uh, does the system itself, can it determine is, if it's uh, an accurate measurement or if, if there's some sort of a... Uh, potential distortion in it. No, no. So, okay. so far, no. I mean, just through the simulation, we, just to make the comparisons, we are assuming that you know exactly where the position was, but um, like the system by, by itself being able to to determine that and correct it automatically, mm. not, not no, so not, far. Not so much correcting it, but knowing that it is incorrect, basically. Uh, but assuming that you know where the target was. Okay. I mean... Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, an example um, 
for instance, on wider areas, we can use uh, latitude and, long and longitude to determine a specific location. But in, uh, in smaller areas, uh, like in these examples, what format do you use to, uh, to say, this is the location of, of, uh, of my target? Just the, the number of the cell, the index of the cell. So it has, granul it has granularity errors, quantization errors. If the grid is, is uh, smaller, you know, it's more accurate. If the grid is bigger, it is less accurate, of course, because it tells you it's in, this, in the cell, but if the cell is the size of this room, it's not so accurate, you know? So it's also, there's also a trade-off in that way that you need to accomplish.